Recorded live. Check, check, one, two. Welcome, Saints, to this October 29, 2014 edition of NTT's presentation of the Kingdom of God with the Eyes of Equity. And welcome to How to Live a Kingdom Life, and welcome to the Back to Eden Project, and welcome to Repent for the Kingdom of God and His Enforcement is Near. I'm your host, Christian Walters. Last week we left off on the second discourse the second teaching of Jesus, and we've been skipping the narratives and been just doing the teachings, which is the discourses. And we're in the book of Matthew, and that second discourse starts in chapter 13. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's the third discourse. That's uh, the teaching of the parables, chapter 13 in Matthew. So Matthew is, uh, this third discourse, its whole context basically is entering the kingdom and growth of the kingdom. Or to put it another way, the kingdom has a present reality. So with that context in mind, it's part of the four parables, and it equals eight, really. And it's the First teaching to the crowds, and then second to the teaching to the disciples. And that chiastic is going over basically is the uh, the teaching to the crowds, but the explanations to the disciples. And why? Well. That's really in chapter, uh, verse 14, which says, You will keep on hearing, but you will not understand. And you will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of the people has become dull. With their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart and return. And I would heal them. Now, I would liken this to today. Remember, this is also the kingdom as a present reality. And if you look at scriptures based on principles, you can apply the principles in any time frame, any time in history, uh, future, or whatever. The scriptures are good for any time frame. But if we don't understand the principles and what the scriptures are based, if we just go by context, then we can't put the understanding of the scriptures to practical application in our lives. And the Bible is totally useless then. Because the real crux of the matter is the teachings do you no good without the understanding. And once you have the understanding, you must put it into practice. It's like the Cain scenario back in Genesis where God approached Cain, and Cain was so depressed. And God asked Cain, he said, you know, what's wrong? Why are you so depressed? He told him that if you do what is right, in other words, do some kind of righteous action, Won't your depression be lifted up? Today the Bible does you absolutely no good until you practice it. And most people, all I can see, do not practice the scriptures. They may know the scriptures. The understanding of the scripture comes into question. It's another thing. But I see nobody really practicing the scriptures. In other words, people are not really sanctifying their lives. Whether they don't understand it, 
uh, whether they don't see the principles behind it, uh, I would uh, point the finger at the pastors in the churches because even they don't even understand it. If you look at the New Testament in general, you have a group of 12 apostles that were called from the world, knew nothing but worldly principles, were caught up in commerce, uh, and called to follow Christ. And they got up and they left house and home and basically left their fortunes, whatever their fortunes were, however little, however great. You know, even a poor man has something, and that's his fortune. That's his riches. Jesus told the rich man, whether he was super rich or Jesus was a poor man that had just a little, but that riches that he had, he said, you know, sell all that you own, give it to the poor so you have good deeds, and come follow me. But these 12 apostles really didn't have the understanding of what Jesus was saying. They didn't grasp what his meaning was, even when he came out and told them point blank. It's like it went right over their head or went in one ear and out the other, and they had their own uh, rendition of what they thought they heard, or basically they were going to reject what he said and not allow what he said because they had their own ideas, and they had the ideas as well as the Pharisees and Sadducees, the ruling Sanhedrin, that when are you going to establish Israel to be king of the world again? When are you going to put it on the top? When are we going to pick up the sword and start fighting and uh, establish that? And he told them all along that that wasn't his purpose, that he came to die on a cross, but they won't accept that. They didn't understand. It's just like today. We don't understand spiritual things, just like they didn't understand spiritual things back then. The spiritual ruling Sanhedrin, Nicodemus comes to Jesus at the night, you know, explaining, he wants to be an explanation of, uh, is he truly the Messiah? Before he gets two words out of his mouth, he gets hit with the question, uh, you got to be born again. It's like, what? He didn't understand. How can a man be born again and enter his mother's womb for the second time? So there's this tremendous lack of understanding. You will keep on hearing, but you will not understand. And you will keep on seeing, but you will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. And with their ears they scarcely hear. And they have closed their eyes, otherwise they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart and return, and I would heal them. That's today, folks. That isn't just back then. That's an ever-present situation with the church. That's what they're dealing with now. That's what all humanity is really dealing with. You've got to remember, the church is no different than the other people. We all came from the same stinking mold. You can't tell the wheat from the chaff. It wasn't until the apostles were basically born again of the Spirit, when they were undo all with the Spirit, they were vitalized with a different understanding and they went from a weak bunch of fear people wanting to deny Jesus three times to the point to where they would die for him. Now that transformation, like Romans 12, 2, that attitude change came about by faith through grace. So you have these parables that he talks about. But the ones that I find really important at this particular time are 
the hidden treasure and the costly pearls, where it's really depicted of how valuable this treasure really is. This, this kingdom that Jesus was implementing, this kingdom that he was establishing. And I don't think the church sees the real importance of this. And what do I mean exactly? It's like I don't think they see the importance of actually putting the scriptures in their lives and manifesting the kingdom, the pearl, in their lives. It's You must chuck your old life. And the only thing that you know and understand 100% is your old life. The way you've been taught and trained and brought up all your life on a system, a system that tells you what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. You have absolutely no thinking or understanding of what you're doing. Everything. Not just some things, everything. You don't understand how totally depraved your mind is. Your your mind is basically toast. You've got all these foreign cliches, foreign understanding of a satanic kingdom And that's all that's in your mind. And that's what Jesus said, that the one who loses his life will save it. That's what he meant. You've got to have an attitude change that you've got to believe that everything that you know and been taught is all garbage. And you need a total revamp. You need a total rewiring of your senses and how you think. It's not just one or two little things that you think is wrong. Oh, now I'm Christian. I can just go on living. No. You must change your whole life system. And the kingdom of God is not manifested in this kingdom, although God is working in this world, in his kingdom. And he is dragging the people, the church, kicking and screaming along the way, just like the apostles did not understand. At some point in time, God is going to awaken the mind by the Spirit and give them another understanding. He's going to give them a heart of flesh. Because they have a heart of stone now. So this costly pearl, this hidden treasure, you have to be a scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven. And if you do, then you're like the head of a household who brings out his treasure, things new and old. That's going to take a transformation. That's going to take a willing attitude to change. Not just a Dr. Feel Good, speak the word, and it'll be done for you because God is not a Santa Claus in heaven. No. It's got to roll up your sleeves and you must actively pull out the idols in your life. And you don't realize what those idols are. The God of the Golden Calf, for one, for starters. The commercial venue that you participate in, you rely on with your life wholeheartedly. That's why he told that rich man, you must sell all that you own. And remember, the rich man is could be the poor guy out in the street that all he's got is a few things, but that's his riches. you got to get rid of the street way you live. you got to change your attitude. Okay, on the other end of the stick, there's this rich man with all kinds of fortunes and treasures and wealth, owning many houses. Same thing for him. He's got to change his lifestyle also. He can't rely on the system the way you got those riches. Not that riches are evil. Things are not evil. It's how you got them. Through which system, through which kingdom did you get them by? That's what needs to be changed.
So Jesus revisited Nazareth there, and they wanted to know, where did this man get this wisdom? What really impressed them was the wisdom, especially the Sanhedrin, because they couldn't stump him. He whipped their butts up and down in a mental contest of wits that there was no contest. By that alone, they should have known who he was. Let alone the miraculous powers that he demonstrated. But the wisdom and the miraculous powers, the wisdom to govern those miraculous powers. What is that wisdom? Well, let me tell you. Psalm 17. 17.2, put on the eyes of equity. He had the eyes of equity because that's where we're going to get the principles from to put these eyes on from. He's already got it. That's what we need to do. Put on this wisdom. Put on the eyes of equity. And the start of it is in Matthew 7.12, the golden rule. Do unto others as you would want to be done to yourself. The law of love, which fulfills all the law. He who comes into equity must be doing equity. If you're loving your brother, you're treating him fairly, you're treating him right, you're treating him just. And that's what it's all about. That's equity. That's uprightness. That's the word righteousness in the New Testament. Dikasanuni, same in the Old Testament. Mishar, uh, Yashar. Equity. Where did he get this wisdom? No, they were just seeing it for the first time. All he had to do was open his mouth. And you knew you were listening to somebody who knew something. And he had such a radical understanding compared to what everybody else understood. Like a 180 degree different opinion. God says, my ways are not your ways. He says, lean not on your own understanding. You don't think like I think. And until you develop that kind of thinking, until you put on the eyes of equity and gain that wisdom, you're not going to have any miraculous powers because you don't have the wisdom to guide you to use them. That's basically a review of chapter 13, the third discourse. Now chapter 14. Here John the Baptist is beheaded. At that time Herod, the Tetrarch, heard the news about Jesus and said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He has risen from the dead. And that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. For when Herod and John had John arrested, he bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip. For John had been saying, it is not lawful for you to have her. Although Herod wanted to put him to death, he feared the crowd because they regarded John as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod and so much that he promised an oath to her Whatever she asked, and having been prompted by her mother, she said, Give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. And although he was grieved, the king commanded it to be given because of his oaths and because of the dinner guests. And he sent and had John beheaded in the prison. And the head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. His disciples came and took away the body and buried it, and they they went and reported to Jesus. 
Now the 5,000 are fed. Now when Jesus heard about John, he withdrew from there in a boat to a scheduled place by himself. And when the people heard this, they followed him on foot from the cities. Cities, the Sodoms and Gomorrahs, as well as today. And went, and when he went uh, ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt compassion for them and healed their sick. And when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This place is desolate and the hour is already late. So send the crowds away that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Buy food for themselves. Now, Jesus got a different idea. Let's start showing that the kingdom does not operate by commercial means. Jesus cast out the money changers in the temple because the money changers, the people doing the commercialization of the temple, were converting the temple into a den of thieves. And God's kingdom does not work on commerce. Sixteen, but Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Like when he told them that, I said, so what? <laughs> How are we going to feed these 5,000 people? We don't have two nickels to rub together. we got an empty basket. Like most people today, I can't help my neighbor. i got too many problems on my plate. I don't have anything to give them at all. i got an empty basket. Yeah, right. you got lack of understanding. You don't know the scriptures. You have little faith. You think that you need some kind of money. But the kingdom of God does not operate by money. And let me show you, it doesn't. And they said to him, we have here five loaves and two fishes. And he said, bring them here to me. Ordering the people to sit down on the grass, he took the five loaves and two fishes and looking up towards heaven, he blessed the food. And breaking the loaves, he gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And so they all ate and were satisfied. Whoa! Where did they get the money to find uh, all that food to feed them? If you're operating in the kingdom by faith, you don't need money. They picked up what was left over, the broken pieces, 12 full baskets. You know, there's such an abundance in the kingdom, you're always going to have more than what you need. But are you operating in the kingdom? You may have one foot in the kingdom, so to speak, that your destiny is secure, that you're going to heaven, and you can't lose it. But you're still alive, and as you walk alive today, you got to lose your life to save it. In other words, the kingdom is not manifested in your life only when you die. But that's not true. You can manifest the kingdom today while you are alive, just like Jesus did. It depends on what you manifest. Which kingdom are you manifesting? Are you able to conquer and move mountains? Are you fearful and cowardly and you don't know your neighbor's needs? So they had 12 baskets full. And there were about 5,000 men who ate besides the women and children. So we're talking at least, you know, 15, 20,000 people there. And now Jesus walks on the water. Verse 22, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. And after he sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. In other words, they were in a real storm. Gee, I wonder if that was programmed. Are we all in the storm today? You got trials and tribulations? You got problems on your plate? You got issues you're dealing with? 
Well, I guarantee the issues that aren't on your plate aren't your problems. Your problem is a lack of understanding. And that's your real problem. That's why you got issues. That's why you're going through mortgage foreclosures. That's why you're losing stuff. And the signpost that got thrown at you, are you seeing the message? The law is given to lead you back to Christ. You're in the wrong kingdom. Get out. Go back home. You don't belong here. Go back to equity. Get back in Jesus' community. Get back in the kingdom. Get that understanding. You shouldn't be where you are. You're doing contracts. You're doing commerce. You're doing mortgages. You shouldn't be doing these things. They're not kingdom right. They're worldly. You're operating on Satan's kingdom. And you're under and subject to his laws. You're using his stuff. And that's not right to say that uh, I don't want to convey the meaning that it's evil to have houses. It's evil to have cell phones or computers or cars. No, it's how you got them. Did you get them through evil ways? Like a commercial. You know, it's, money is not really evil. It's how it's used. There are certain times when money is used in the kingdom, but it's not dependent upon it. Verse 25, And in the fourth watch of the night he came to them walking on the sea, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. Man, they thought they saw an apparition, a ghost. And they said, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. They all thought that they were going to die. And they were seeing things. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. How many times did he say that? Don't be afraid. No, we say, well, you know, we can't fight City Hall. Why not? Because you're afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. Do you get out of the boat in your problems? Or do you continue doing the normal thing that you've done for the last 40 years? Tell me what you're doing differently in your life today than you're doing yesterday or the day before. If you can't tell me anything, then you haven't made no change. You haven't made a kingdom swap. You're still you're still worldly. You still have worldly values. You still have worldly knowledge. You still have worldly understanding. And that puts you in the world. Even though you got one foot in heaven. Sealed with the Holy Spirit, indwelled with the Holy Spirit. Where are you, Adam? Where are all my children from Adam? So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, in other words, he's focusing on his problems rather than on Jesus, and the miraculous power to utilize the wisdom. But seeing the wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. So this can be taken two ways, you know. Okay, the normal teaching is, all right, this demonstrates that Christ is the Savior of the world. Okay, right, yes. But what about John, uh, what about Peter walking on the water? You know, Jesus didn't walk for him. Peter had to get out of the boat. Peter had to walk on the water. Is the church walking on the water today? Lord, save me. Lord, save the church. Now, he already has in justified sense. 
but I hope Lee soon opens their minds and their eyes and their ears so that they could walk on the water. Because that's the only way you're going to really solve your issues on your plate, by eliminating your problem. Not by attacking your issues directly. You attack the problem. Remember, the problem is the thing that holds the plate up that the issue is on. You can't see the problem. You just see the issue because that's what you're focused on. Your immediate issue is not your problem. It's your lack of understanding. He cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, You have little faith. How many times did he tell everybody that? Church, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Doubt what? That he could walk on the water? Church, why do you doubt? Why do you think you can't solve the problems of the world today? Well, I'll tell you why. Because you're focused on your issues. You don't see the real problem. It's fear and doubt. Lack of understanding. In other words, you don't trust God and his word. That's what it boils down to. I, I see many Christians who know the scriptures, but they don't know the scriptures. They do not have faith in what they recite. It's like, is the nation of Israel presented with the Jordan River? Are they going to cross over? Send the spies out over there and let's see what they report back with. Only two reported back with the good news that, hey, the fruit over there was big, let's go. And the rest of them, the other eight, said, no, nah, we can't take this land. There's giants in there. Remember, the giants are the issues on your plate. The things you shouldn't be looking at. You weren't believing on what God said, that he was going to give you the land to possess. And that lack of faith caused them to walk around the mountain for 40 years until every one of them dropped dead except the two that said, we could take the land, Joshua and Caleb. The rest of them that were of the age to know all perished. Church, you're perishing today for the same reason. You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind stopped, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly God's Son. They're starting to get the message. They're starting to operate with a different set of rules, a different legal system. They're starting to operate without commerce. Remember, Jesus sent out them, commissioned them two by two and sent them out without a bag, without a cloak. Sent them out without anything. That means no wallet. I'd like to see you go out on your job this week with no wallet. But that's the difference. You have a job. These apostles had a job. You know, if you wrote that on the wall... You must get rid of your J-O-B and get a J-O-B. You wouldn't get the message. You would need an interpreter because it's the, the pronunciation of the word that brings on a different meaning, but yet they're both spelled exactly the same. What a dualism there is. The diametrically opposed meanings. The job in the kingdom of Satan, or the Job doing the works of God in his kingdom. When they had crossed over, they came to a land, Gennesaret, and there, when the men had been in that place recognized him, they sent word into all the surrounding districts and brought to him all who were sick, and they implored him that they might just touch 
the fringe of his cloak, and as many as touched it were cured. Wow. It's like, all you got to do is draw near to the kingdom, and you'll get a touch from God. But your hearts are far from me. You will keep on hearing, but you will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but you will not perceive. For the heart of the people has become dull. And with their ears they scarcely hear. And they have closed their eyes, otherwise they would hear with their, uh, see with their ears, eyes, and hear with their ears. And understand with their heart and return. And I would heal them. Understand with their heart, and I would heal them, and return. Understand with their heart and return, invoking my name. The man who wants to save his life will lose it. The way of the cross. It's sanctification in Romans chapter 6 and 7. It's something that you must do. And if you don't, when you die, then God is going to fully sanctify you. And he will do it in the end. But you have the opportunity to do it now and work for God's kingdom now. Not for the world. Now that brings us to chapter 15, the most important section in Matthew, I think. Chapter 15. It's the law or the tradition versus the commandments of God or the equity of God or the love of God, which really is the whole law. This chapter 15 is a real bingo. This chapter 15 should be applied to all of scriptures. You should look through all scriptures as 15 being the main focus, context-wise, I would say. Verses 1 through 20 it really comes down to the question of the law. And it basically is saying that the law that is being taught back then and today is all wrong. And that the teachers of the law are blind guides, teaching the blind. And when the blind lead the blind, they both wind up in a pit. That's the scenario of today. We're all in a pit. And we don't recognize we're in a pit. Fifteen one. Then some Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? Here, right off the bat, they're asking him, you know, uh, How come you guys are doing everything all wrong, not according to the law? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And he answered and said to them, throwing it right back at them, why do yourselves transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? In other words, you guys think you're teaching the law right, and you have no sense of what God is telling you. And you're supposed to be the ruling Sanhedrin, and the way the ruling Sanhedrin goes, there goes Israel. So all of Israel is off, because nobody understands what God's really saying to them. You can go back into the Old Testament of all the prophets, and they killed all the prophets. Every time Israel was off base, they sent a prophet, he sent a prophet to them to correct them, and they couldn't understand what the prophets were saying, nor did they agree with them, so they killed them. So we got to take into context here that this was Jesus' uh, conflict, major thing that he had wrong with the world. It's really the worldliness that he was 
bringing out, and he was bringing it out to the, the, the 12 apostles in private up till now. In this chapter 15, he finally brings it out publicly. This is the public speaking where he tells the crowds the same thing he's been teaching the apostles about the worldliness of the world that's in conflict with the kingdom and its principles. Why do you yourselves transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother, and he would speak evil of his father and mother is to be put to death. But you say, Whoever says to his father or mother, What I have that would help you has been given to God. He is not to honor his father or mother. And by this you invalidate the word of God for the sake of your traditions. You hypocrites. Rightly did Isaiah prophesy to you. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines and precepts of men. That's church today. They have the same legal understanding. They do not have the eyes of equity on. Otherwise, you would get a different perspective. You would have a different different teaching, and you would have different actions. After Jesus called the crowd to him, he said to them, Hear and understand. It is not what enters into the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth. This defiles the man. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard that statement? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father did not plant shall be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if a blind man guides a blind man, both will fall into a pit. So Peter said to him, Explain that to us. Explain the parable to us. And Jesus said, Are you still lacking in understanding also? That's the church. Lacking in understanding. Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man? For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. And these are the things which defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. If you don't understand the principle in 1 through 20 here in chapter 15, that it's really the principle of the question of the law, that the law was being taught wrongly. But I'll guarantee you to everybody at that time, they thought that their elders were teaching them correctly just like today. You think that your pastors are teaching you correctly. So, with 1 through 20 being the context about the question of the law, because this is the real bingo, the teaching the law the wrong way as blind guides. Equity is the real substance of the law, is the real whole law. The law and the prophets. But they had a wrong interpretation of the law that the prophets were telling them about. But they refused to believe it and understand. So keep that in context with what we just read earlier in chapter 14 and the other discourse, first, second, and third discourses here. Jesus is teaching the correct way by his words that he spoke and by demonstrating it also by what he did, his walk, his actions, his deeds. And what he did, what he spoke, was 
totally, totally backwards from the understanding of the rulers of that time and today. The great pearl, the hidden treasure, hidden, hidden treasure, although it's work, it's walking, you know, at that time, right before your eyes. You can't see it. Today, you can't see the spirit because you're not tuned into it. You're not tuned into equity. So we'll pick up on the Syrophoenician woman there in verse 21, but we'll probably start chapter 15 over again. So we'll pick up on chapter 15 next time. I mean, this this third discourse has got a lot of meat in it. Because if you go forward, you go through 15 into 16, you get, you know, the big one here, discipleship in 1624. Discipleship is costly. you got to lose your life to save it. But the thing that you're going to get, the pearl, has far greater value than what your costliness you're going to get rid of. In other words, you're going to inherit something even greater. To get rid of your money and your idols, your worship of commerce, and you start operating without money, and you start doing like feeding the 5,000 from an empty basket because you have the wisdom to govern the miraculous powers that the kingdom contains, the great treasure. You could move the mountain. But you need the wisdom. You need the understanding. You need God's way of thinking. Equity. You need to know what love is. You need to know what's fair, just, and right. Unfortunately, that's been written on your heart. That's is what's written on your heart. Equity's written on your heart, not the Ten Commandments. What's written on your heart is equity. You have the understanding, you know when things are fair, just, and right. The only problem is, you know when it's not being done to you, but you don't do it to other people. First, he who comes into equity must be doing equity. In other words, you've got to be loving your brother first in order for you to get loved back. That's the stumbling block. For Christians, it's looking for the opportunity to give. Even when you think you have an empty basket. Because really your basket is not empty. God wants you not to walk by sight. What you see or what you don't see. He wants you to walk by faith. Believing that you're going to get whatever you need out of that empty basket. God knows what you have need of. You're with many more sparrows to him. But he wants you, your faith walk to be increased so that you do not doubt and you don't walk in fear. And he's putting you through a test. And that test is a big sign in front of your face, hitting you in the two, like a two by four hitting you in the forehead. That's saying to you, You don't belong here. Get out of here. You're in the wrong system. Those that aren't going through any kind of problem, although I think everybody's really got a problem today, because even if you ask the richest people out there, you know what their problem is? 
Uh, they're going to the shrinks and the psychologists and trying to figure out why they're so depressed because they want to kill themselves. I think they've got a problem. And the problem is they're putting their trust in money and riches, and money and riches don't solve your problems. Because that's really an issue. What's really causing your issue or what you think is the problem is the wisdom that you lack for utilizing the wealth and the money that you have. And you're not doing the good deeds that keeps you out of your depression, like king. They're not doing the right actions, the right thinking. That's why their minds are messed up. That's why the church basically is stuck on start. So we'll pick up on chapter 15 next week on the third discourse. And now, anyone out there I'd like to, that's heard this word, that would like to become a Christian. And it comes down to Acts 16.30 where the Philippians jailer was said, what must I do to be you know, born again or saved? What what work? What do I got to do? You know, and Paul responded back to him and said, "Just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved." Now, believe, you know, faith or belief has an object, and that object is Jesus Christ. But what Jesus Christ did, and what he did was he died on a cross. Good news is he died on a cross and was buried. And three days later, he rose from the grave. And the significance of that, the understanding of that is that that's him paying the debt for you. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 through 4, where the gospel is spelled out with no additions, nothing added to it. It's pure, unadulterated grace message. Faith alone, belief alone, trust alone, confidence alone, and what Christ's cross work accomplished. That it did a total propitiation of the debt, a total payment for the debt. And that's your ticket into heaven. If you would just believe that, that's that's what saves you. And then with that, Number seven, blessings come in place. That the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. So they shall invoke my name on the sons of Israel, and I then will bless them. If you do this, I will do that. That really is the covenant. That's God's everlasting law. If you walk in my ways, in my statutes, if you do my commandments, which is really the law of love, and love fulfills the law, if you put on the eyes of equity and you start acting equitably, and you do it coming into equity, then you have the right, and I will bless you. So untie the hands of God in your life by getting the wisdom and understanding of the eyes of equity, putting that on, Psalm 17, 2. And you will see the whole scriptures from a different point of view. A whole different dimension will open up Instead of the legal side of the scriptures, you will see the spiritual side of the scriptures. And you will come from the traditions of precepts made by men into the real godly understanding of what God's been trying to tell everybody since the ages of time. Now, 
Then I will heal them. And with that, I close and we'll pick up on the chapter 15 next time and let's go to Q&A. Anybody have a comment or a question, press star 8 to raise your hand and get in the queue line. Press star 8. Questions, comments, anyone? Star 8. State your name, where you're from. Anyone question, comment? Star eight. Hello. Yes, who's this? Hi, this is Wanda. Hi, Wanda. Uh, I can just barely hear you. Uh, okay. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, go ahead. A little bit better. Yes, sir. my question is concerning the, uh, when you said that you, as far as giving up your, um, giving up the commerce, and that's my interpretation, my understanding of what you're saying. As far yes. as um, having having belongings and you know uh, different things that you have, you know that we use in life. I was just wondering, well, what, how, like, what? And you said it wasn't um, evil to have, but um, I, I, can you explain that a little bit more about how we have to have yeah, things that we need? It's not that having houses and cars and cell phones and computers and all kinds of stuff like that, but how you got it. You know, like I said, money is not evil, but the way that the money is used, uh, where the money came from, how you got the money. In other words, did you get the money going to work at a job? Or did God just give you the money because you were doing his work? Because the workman is worth his wages. You know, why did Jesus send out the apostles with no wallet, no money bag, no cloak? Don't take anything with you. Do you go to your job that way? No. You see, we're so dependent upon the system and the way the system's set up, and we're taught that we have to have money. And that's what all we do. That's all we operate with. But yet, Jesus, I can see nowhere in scriptures that he utilized money. He walked around with one homespun from house to house and never bought anything. In fact, he didn't even pay the tax for himself. He had Peter do it. But do we go to the fish's mouth to get the coin that we'd need to go pay the tax or buy the thing that we need? How did the money come? Well, on the kingdom's process, it comes miraculously. The money that you need to buy the house or to buy the thing comes through kingdom principle of miracles. And miracles in the kingdom are a standard thing. It'll happen every every day hourly. That's the only way how it operates. And you remember, you've got a God that is your source. He's the creator of gold and silver. The whole world and all of creation is his. And he is in the ability to create matter out of nothing. And he took care of the Israelites for 40 years in the desert. That 20 million group of people that their clothes didn't wear out, he fed them with quail and manna from heaven. He gave them water from a rock. And why do you doubt that he can't give you money from a fish's mouth if you need money?
but no, Satan's got us working 40, 50, 60 hours a week for him. And you're trading your life that you got from God freely because he gave you life. You're converting that life into worthless pieces of paper and you think that's substance. No. You should be working on creating things directly and instead you, you use Satan's kingdom to convert your time into worthless pieces, pieces of paper. And you have no control over the conversion rate. And you're getting a double whammy taken away from you and the bulk of your time is not getting converted 100% into substance because most of it's getting taken away from you. You're getting a little bit back. And then you're getting nothing. But if you were creating something and making something yourself, making substance yourself, there is no other parties involved to take anything from that conversion and therefore you keep 100% of your time converted into the substance and you have 100% of everything that you would make. And then you could give from that. No, you, the system teaches you you got to go to work at a job so you can get money. Then you go take that money, you go to the grocery store and buy your groceries. If you had a hydroponic setup in your backyard and you created your own fruits and vegetables, you would need to go to Publix down the street of the grocery store. There's no comparison what you could grow in your backyard compared to what you buy at the grocery store, even in nutritional value. And I believe that God would bless that garden in your backyard because you were giving it to your neighbors and that he would multiply it up so that you could give it to your neighbors, that you would have more than enough for yourself. Now, if everybody did that, basically everybody needs food, water, shelter, and transportation. Those are the basic needs in life. Water is pretty available just about any place. So it's food. If, if you had to, you could live in a tent. But, you know, most people, they want to live in a house. Okay, so, but what's it going to take to do that? And transportation, well, you know, everybody wants, you got a bicycle. You can get around on a bicycle if you had to. But it's not that you're going to forever live in a tent and that you're ever forever going to live pedaling a bicycle. No. But you've got a lifetime of digging your own pit, according to the world, and you've got to slowly get out of that and change. Now, that may take a lifetime again. So there's a whole lifetime change that has to go, you know, but you may have to be willing to live in a tent for a short while or pedal a bicycle for a short while until you get an established garden in the backyard or until you, you know, get a system going and operating in God's kingdom to where now you got a car, now you got a house. So we got, as Christians, we got some backpedaling to do. We got some unwinding of the system to do. And we have to start. We have to start somewhere. We have to start sometime. And why not now? So what you're talking about and what I'm talking about is really the Back to Eden project. And we haven't really formally announced that just yet. That's coming up here in the future. More into the details of the specifics. All right, how are we going to go about this? Like if you need a house, we've got a group of people getting together that uh, we're building a machine to make bricks. We're going to make bricks without straw. And with the bricks that we make, we're going to build you a house because you need a house. And anybody that needs a house, you know, is going to we're going to give them a house. 
and then that person needs to utilize the ground, and they need to grow something or do something or create something that they can give to other people. And if more and more people grow into this, then and we start supporting one another, then just like the early church in Acts, nobody had any needs because everybody saw each other's needs, what they needed, and they all fulfilled them. There was a, a unity in the church. Today, I doubt whether anybody knows their neighbor in the church. They see them there. But you see, the church meets in a building down the street once a week. No, these people in the old church, they met in each other's houses. They knew one another. They could see what they needed because they were in their houses. Hey, you got a spouting it down over here. You know, I'll be over next week and we'll nail that back up. You know, we'll fix that. Hey, your roof's got some leaks in it, I see. Hey, let's, we'll go up there on top and we'll get a bunch of guys together and we'll, we'll fix it. So that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. And all this doesn't require money. You know, how many times have you thrown the seeds or your tomatoes out? If you were to save those seeds, how many tomato plants can you grow out, to, out of just one seed? How many tomatoes are on a tomato vine plant? Dozens. How many seeds are in each tomato itself. Hundreds. So from one seed planted, how many seeds can you get for the next seeding planting? In Genesis it says, I've given you the seeds of the earth for food. How many of us plant seeds? So we can't operate without money. We can operate in substance. That's just one example, see. But everything that you look in your home that you have is made from substance of the ground. All you need is the ground. And we already have the ground. The ground has been given to us freely by God as our possession. Genesis says that God gave creation, the earth, to man to possess. It's the worldly system of Satan that says, you know, you don't possess the ground. You don't own the ground. Oh, you can't do that there. Well, these are exigent circumstances. Yes, I can. I have to eat. I can grow more chickens in my backyard, and it's over the limit, but these are exigent circumstances. i got to feed my family. You can raise rabbits. You can raise chickens. You can raise fruits and vegetables. You can do canning and store it in a, uh, a cold house over the winter. We can do these things without money. It just takes a willingness to change. And then once we get a, into a different system, then we get rid of our bicycles, we get rid of uh, our tents, and we move into houses, and we move into cars, and we move into better things. But you're going to have to lose your life to save it. Because the Titanic is sinking. The world is sinking. So I hope I shed some light on that and explained it a little better. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, but I have one other question. Sure. Uh, when we get, okay, so the back to the easy project would be the system that to get you back to the basic, um, this is my interpretation. Yeah, back on track. Back on track, okay. And then 
it begins, I mean, then it continues with equity, equity uh, for from the right sources to create the necessities uh, of, that are needed. Yeah, um, equity is the wisdom to utilize the substance wisely. Okay. So when we get back to the, you know, once you get the back to, so this would be the back to even, and then, um, you know, getting, having car, uh, houses and cars. Yeah, it's food, transportation, water, food, you know, these kind of things. Everybody needs these things. Okay. So it's based on the uh, equity, receiving it uh, or, or obtaining these things through the equitable process. Yeah. Opposed to the you got them through the means, or through kingdom means, which are through equity, uh-huh. rather than through the system, the way it's set up, and how you're told to do it. Okay. I see. Mm-hmm. Yes, thank you so much. I I I, I understand clear now. Okay. I appreciate that. Anything else? Um, that's all right now. I mean, if I think of something. Yeah, it's like, it's kind of a, a a brand new concept, and really, if you haven't thought about it, it's kind of difficult to visualize. You know, how I'm gonna how am I gonna survive without money? Well, I don't expect everybody to like jump off cold turkey. You know. You have to start creating some things to jump into. You just can't jump off that system. It's like you got to wean yourself from it. Like instead of going to the grocery store and buying groceries, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna start making more of a garden in the backyard and start filling that in with what I would get by not buying at the grocery store. Until I totally got off the grocery store. Then what you can't do yourself, somebody else should be doing that. Like, you know, I, you grow tomatoes, I grow lettuce. And I give you lettuce, you give me tomatoes. Mm-hmm. So uh, this fellow over here, he's a carpenter. He does woodworking. You know, he builds uh, cabinets. He builds tables and chairs. You know, he builds hutches. And they look just like you would buy, say, uh, rooms to go, you know. These are craftsmen. They make the same stuff that Walmart sells. It looks no different. It's of the same quality. In fact, it's probably going to be better because, you know, whatever you do, do it as if doing it to the Lord. You know, today, the stuff made at Walmart is so cheap because... It's commercial. And commercial says, hey, we have to save on expenses. We'll put the cheapest material we can. We'll make it as cheap as we can because we're going to make more money. So that is actually a millstone around your neck, that commerce, because the product is not made to last. The product is made just to get you by, cheap enough to uh, fulfill what you're going to use it for, and then two weeks later it falls apart and you've got to buy another one. Where if there was no commercialness involved in it, you would build it the best that you can and it would last. So that's another concept uh, benefit. Because now there's no commercialness involved in what we make. I'm going to do the very best that I can in whatever I make. And I'm going to give it to somebody else that's in need, and it's going to last them, you know, longer than you would buy it from Walmart. You go to Walmart, you buy this cheap Chinese stuff, it falls apart before you get it home. So we got to get off of this mentality of that, and um, we got to start creating our own substance. And that way we're in full control of what, Reproduce. Oh, any other questions? Uh, not at this time. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for coming on then.
All right, she'll mute you out then. All right, who's next? Anybody question, comment? Uh, press star eight. Hello? Hello, who's this? Hi, Christian. This is Cynthia on uh, Massachusetts. Hi, Cynthia. How are you doing? Oh, God. Um, I think it's just up and down, up and down. And it was so funny, though. There are light bulbs going off, which are which is um, inspiring. When you tonight, when you said, um, God said, if you do this, I'll do that, because I know in the legal language too, this and that. And what I took from that was, um, if I solely, with a single mindedness, do God's will, like which I've tried to do from quite a young age, then I'll get that, the things that a father yeah. wants to give their daughter. Yeah, he's obligated to give you. you know, By doing that, you obligate God to fulfill what he said he will do. You know, in the um, 80s, 70s, um, I was raised in California, and then I moved back east for... Uh, Catholic monasteries for my kids to be educated at, trying, you know, seeking to do, um, fulfill God's will, you know, for myself and and the children. And what came of that, though, now looking at at these past years, is that that I never knew that um, it was really difficult to choose doing fully God's will because. The world was always, you know, you have kids, and then, you know, you have, like, whatever. You have to have a lifestyle, have to have vacation, you know, go to Martha's Vineyard, do this. Well, go make sure you have ski vacations. But, and, uh, you know, go to math every Sunday, blah, blah, the whole nine yards. But these two worlds, they conflicted so much that, um, for me, it was not, you know, it got me to a place where in two thousand in 2011, I said, you know, there's there's something not right here. After my losses, my big, you know, those those my big losses started, worldly losses, I suppose you would say. But um, so since then, though, my comment tonight is that it's just um, the study when you said, um, you you know, the kingdom of heaven, you have to know how to access the substance that's there for you to provide for your lifestyle. Yes. I, I jumped off. I'd like a year ago, I like completely jumped jumped off. And it's it's a very weird, it's the strangest way to live because I get blessings and everything, but it's nothing in the way that I, I used to expect it. Okay, I'm doing God's will. You know, things should go smoothly and like this, and in the, in the writing and this, and uh, it doesn't happen like that. Um, but you know, the inspiration comes, and I'm provided for everything in the manner that God sees that my needs are met. But like my own self will. Uh, no. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes I'm even today going off to do something. I said, you know, I just want to write all day. I do not want to do this, you know, this giving. But, you know, this is I'm so happy I did it today. I mean, that's how I felt in the morning. But so it's just. Um, yeah, if we look at giving as being, you know, Philippians 4, 13 and forward, how the account is filled up. There's the empty basket being filled by your giving. I mean, but that's a quandary to the world. How am I going to give from an empty basket so that the basket could be filled up? But God says you got to give to receive. So the whole problem is the world has taught you that you can't give from an empty basket, but as far as I can see everywhere in the Scripture, it points out that, hey, you can feed thousands from an empty basket. Mm. It, it is a miracle, and I don't... Personally, I don't have enough, um, whatever, awake people or I have four grown children and, you know, and like even today I was saying, I was saying something, somebody, uh, my ex-husband was driving me somewhere and I said, Joe, just imagine if the whole motivation would be um, for people working is like, you know, what can you give all the things that, that you previously were saying in the past couple of minutes, like, like, um, you know, I have a dream of making soap. Oh, I love soap. You know, I can just get lost. I love the garden and flowers. If I could just be outside in the garden all day, every day, I would be, that would be my happiest. You'd be in the Garden of Eden. Yeah, exactly, exactly. 
So, um, but my comment was really that it's just take you know finally I'm um, my origin trust. I couldn't. I have all the other things, all the other flow, whatever my 25 steps. I call it my 25 steps to go. But I finally, finally, my origin, my the Bible with Dillard's help from from some of your other things. That finally, I couldn't do any of my other trusts execute them properly until that one was done right. And it's it is it's it's a true um, it's a true covenant. Yeah, we just don't believe that God will do what He says He will do. We don't test Him. He says, "Test me on these things. See if I'll do what I didn't promise you to do." Oh, I think you. Oh no, yeah. The the test though always. It's many times for me. It does. It just. I'm always provided for. It's just never in the way that I. Um, in my um, old way, or in this paradigm shift, or you know, crossing over, or whatever, a lot of times the answers that come are not what you know I would think how it's supposed to be. And yet, at the end of the day, or whatever, I, my intention was pure, and I, I feel good about that. And if I, if there's corrections along the way, I have to humbly, you know, take them or whatever, not accept them and acknowledge them, and and you know, say I'm not going to do that again. Yeah, we're we're being robbed by going to a job. By not having a job, we're being robbed. Because we don't create anything at the job. Somebody else creates it. We just yep. participate in it, but we don't have any say-so of it. And we don't reap anything from it. We think we get a paycheck, but we don't get it really. Uh, uh, we get blank pieces of paper with numbers on them. I know when you when you said when you were saying we we get a paycheck, it's like we're it's like we're getting it like in um in a not in the not in the worldly way, whereas yes, and we how have much it all it's all right there waiting. Yeah, right. Uh, the paycheck. How much deductions did they take out, and how much taxes did you pay? How much do you have left from the conversion of your time for that week? But if you took that same amount of time, forty hours and put it in your own job creating things yourself. Everything that you made with your hands, you would have 100%. That's a synergistic multiplication. Instead of working for the system, now you're working in the kingdom with kingdom principles. I just heard somebody that go on and on about the hydroponics and about how fast things grow and how how fruitful the, the projects are. It was just, I heard you had talked about the hydroponics before. It's just, um, that is like miracle growth. Yeah, you can grow a head of lettuce as big as a basketball in 30 days. I mean, like, that's crazy. I mean, I go out to the garden, and I'm just like, you know, try to make sure that on my sunflowers that these little bugs aren't going to get the first leaves coming out every day. And, you know, like, I kind of like pet, the, I almost feel sometimes I'm petting my plants. And these hydroponics, they grow that fast. It's like, that's that's just a miracle. It's just me. It's awesome. So I think that, the, you know, I didn't want to hold hold the call it, but I just want to say how much I appreciate, you know, all of you. And um, I just, this last week, I think this last Thursday, because I really am now doing all my serious writing, I said, nope, no more. A long time ago, I cut myself off from TV and, and TV and radio and that kind of stuff quite a lot, almost three years two years at least, but so now it's like since last Thursday, I'm like, no internet, no revolution radio, no nothing, you're just going to do Christian Walters or Brandon or, you know, the 400 other ones, and there's so much gold in those very beginning ones. Oh, my word, I didn't listen to the ones prior to 2009, Um, November 7, 2009, I didn't listen to the prior ones, and I, I have been, and I was like... Oh my word! It's like all the groundwork and and all that creditors and commerce and stuff. And the flip side of it is where now I can see the flip side is where the answer is. All that not um, administrative stuff doing that. So for me, it's just been making a lot more sense. I don't know if that made sense, but um, yeah, all that DC stuff was in the world. Here's yes, the equity but, the side. Right, but trust is the other side. But you know. That whole obverse reverse, you know, if I teach you the black trust, you'll know the white trust by sight. Right, right. So um, 
And the second, you know, it's like being able to read two languages. It's bizarre. If so, if so. But and reading the Bible now, the Bible is is written because understanding the language in a different way now, all the words pop out on the page. Pages. So um, I love you guys. Thank you. You know, hopefully, if I use the forum more, um, you know, maybe there could be see some people in the Northeast here in the Boston area. Mm hmm. Well, it's, as it's, we a, it's a drag being looked at as a crazy person, or like, like um, I was sitting at, at a um, at a birthday party with you know with some of my relatives or doctors, like big doctors, you know, and uh, you know I can't talk about. Anyways, sometimes if I talk about some of the stuff that I know, like it's it's like it's I I it's like I feel like I encroach on people. It's like they're like, where well, you're out there. <laughs> if I say, you know. Someone said, you know, well, you know, I have, um, I had quite a large business. Now, it's, it's down to about 20% because I, um, it's almost all the way there, but that's my only subject actually right now until I um, am crossing over, so to speak. Um, oh, I lost my train of thought. Oh. Well, I, excuse me? You're crossing over, you said? Um, yeah, but, you know, whatever point I was going to make, I have now I'm exhausted of my own thoughts. But I'm, And I'm just really excited to talk to you, so I want to say goodbye. It must be time for me to um, say goodnight, all. And you are just, you know, you um, and your wife, Lisa, are, and, uh, and all your extended ones, it's just a miracle. You know, I want to be in um, back at the project, back at the Eden Project. Well, uh, you know, once we get more involved in it, you know, it's like uh, not just hydroponics. Really, we're talking about aquaponics because, you know, aquaponics involves the, the fish with it. Yeah, that yes, there was fish with it. So I, I probably used the wrong um, term for it. Yeah, no, because the fish are part of the whole ecological thing, right, of feeding it and the whole yeah, the circle. Yeah. It's a full circle, yeah. And then if you throw in rabbits and you throw in chickens on top of that, you know, you've got just about what you would need to survive. This last year, we have chickens here. They started laying maybe like four or five months ago. Oh, my, five chickens. They're huge. They lay, there's, from these five chickens, there is like a dozen of eggs to give away all, yeah. like, all the time. There's too many eggs now. Right, <laughs> right. It's crazy. I mean, that's just five chickens. Yeah, it's like you got so many eggs, you got to give them away. Yeah, yeah, we are, yeah, definitely. Or so boil the them up. The <laughs> system of Satan's guys set up that he causes you to sin, but when you start doing this stuff in the kingdom, that causes you to to give. Exactly. <laughs> brings you more blessings. Oh yeah, that's wonderful. So if you throw in, you know, chickens, you throw in rabbits, and you throw in uh, the lettuce from the hydroponics, and then when you have the fish tanks with it, it's called aquaponics, and then it's a balance. And now you got fish, rabbits, chickens. I mean, you got a variety of, of meats. Then you got uh -huh. vegetables. And if yeah. you throw in some other stuff like potatoes or something, you know, and some fruits, then you got everything that you need, really. You know what grew really well? For um, really bad soil here was um, in a place was um, yams or sweet sweet potatoes. They uh -huh. took off like crazy. Well, it's like if you grow sweet potatoes because your ground up there grows sweet potatoes, and somebody else grows tomatoes over here, and then everybody gives everybody what they need, and everybody's got sweet potatoes and tomatoes and potatoes and whatever. You know, exactly. nobody's in need of anything. Now the only thing with those uh, domesticated rabbits is my son has them. They they want them for the children, the two two kids. But um, if you don't have them in a cage that has like a real cage or whatever, and just in a yard, say you want to cage them in, they tunnel down and they go. They just go away. They go into other people's yards. They're a menace. If you don't, if if they can tunnel, they're they make a menace of of work. Well, how are you going to get them if they're in a the cage? Yeah. 
Yeah, no, they have to be in a cage, or yeah, or you have to have if, if they're on the ground something where they can't tunnel out. Right, right. But because they're, they're they're like they're crafty little critters. Yes, yeah, so though I think that would be a um, a wonderful way to nur- to nourish people in the Back to Eden project. Have food, water, shelter, and transportation. Uh, yeah. W- it w- Machines to produce other machines that produce the things that we need to Where create. Is a the, where's the kingdom going to be located? Uh, we could be exactly where you are. We just share with one another wherever we are. That's cool. You're right now about neighbors. A, Pe- people, yeah. I mean, like on this street, you know, this is like a neighborhood with like whatever, five houses on each side of the street. People don't really, I know three or four, but it's not like in the 60s or like whatever, 70s growing up, everyone played on the street and like that. So I think there is a bit of a disconnect. Yeah. People Big are time. afraid to talk to one another. Or I you know. think people are looking at it, you know, it's like, ah, you're invading my privacy. So... Yeah, I suppose they think that you know you're not going to love them. So they're they're afraid to show you their lives. Hmm. Yeah, okay, yeah, uh, yeah. It could be two way street there. <laughs> but anyway, so it's back to Eden. That's the whole thing. But you're an inspiration. Thank you, Christian. All right. Thanks, Cynthia, for coming on. Appreciate you also. Thank you. Good night, guys. Okay, who's next? Next caller? Nobody? Got an empty board? Okay, anybody? Uh, star 8? Sorry to ask a question or comment. Star 8, anybody? R eight. All right. Anybody question? Good evening, Christian. Hey, Lawrence. How are you? Fine. Blessings to all the saints. Um, you had mentioned that we needed to get equity in the simple meaning of that, what would it be? Well, it's an awful broad term, you know. Uh, you know it's, that word is like on the tip of the pyramid, but as you come down, the base gets wider in its explanation. And it takes and encompasses many things. Uh, it, I can't put it into, you know, simple basic words, I can start at the top and do that and come down, but you know it, it takes more and more explanation as you come down farther, and it encompasses many more things. But you could say equities at the top, down a little farther from that, you got what's fair, just, and right. And now, how do you explain what's fair, just, and right? Because really, you're talking about love. So that's where we're going to start explaining better what's fair, just, and right. But, you know, the Scriptures does an excellent job of that already. And I think that's what people lack, is the understanding that's already there. I don't need to explain it. It's it's there. You just have to put on the eyes of equity to see it. Now, that takes a different kind of reasoning, a different kind of thinking, a different attitude change, a Romans 12, 2 attitude change. And that only comes by Romans 1, 12, 1, which is a, uh, your spiritual act of worship motivated by, uh, through God's grace, through faith. You know, I don't have to worry about God teaching about his kingdom. If it's not me, it's going to be somebody else. This 
what's happening now could be just the beginning seed planting, but it is not going to be stopped. If it's not me, it's going to be somebody else. You can't thwart God. He's going to open the minds of his people and pour out his water and understanding in their hearts. And if it isn't Christian Walters, it'll be Lawrence or somebody else. So I'm just doing my job. And somebody else will come along and take my place after me. I'm just one in the chain link that's going on forever. I'm just blessed that I'm able to do what I am able to do and to see what I see and to tell everybody else. And hopefully they'll see it too. So to put it in simple terms, no, it takes a study. You weren't Uh, You may have been born into Satan's kingdom and brainwashed all your life with everything that you've been brainwashed with, but now it's time to wash your mind with something different. And through the meditation on the Word, to get the understanding, to get the discernment, uh, learning on how to put on the eyes of equity and what it all means. How to lose your life to save it. How to invoke his name. How to do the cross work walk. You know, all these things will come to pass. So to simplify and put it, you know, ten words or less, no, nah, nah, that's like, uh, yeah, I can't explain it in just ten words. But we've been talking about it in all the past shows. It's not a a list of ten things on a quick list that you can do and automatically you're going to be there. No. can't just tell you ten simple things. It's a lifestyle. It's a way of thinking. And not just now and then, but all the time. scriptures say that if you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Do we do that? Is God on our thoughts continuously? No. And you know how I know that? Because I know myself. And everybody is like me. But I can continually more and more think about godly things. And when you do, your life starts changing because your understanding starts changing. So it all starts with the seed planting and the watering. And that's where I come in. I plant a seed, God waters, takes care, prunes, and it bears fruit, with or without me. So, you know, I just can't say in ten words or less and explain in a nutshell what you got to do or what you got to understand. Uh, it's just you got to keep working at it. Well, Christian, that was quite a bit there. Even in that just brief discourse right there, that was a mouthful. So thank you for that. Um, I wish it was that. that. I wish it was that simple, you know. But you know, it. Well, people can have the mindset that they do go about their life pattern in that they are thinking good and doing good for their brother is as they come across in each situation. But they're still consumed by theirs too. So they're not totally asleep. They, they're trying to do, but 
but they're still doing commerce. Now yeah. that that's uh, the that's the crux of things. How to get them to explain that that piece of paper is the burden on them. Right, and that's not going to happen overnight because you just can't jump off cold turkey. You have to have some kind of net or some kind of ground you're going to move on to, you know, from where you are. To put off that realm, you're going to have to put on another realm. And you're going to have to uh, recognize what that realm is and what you're going to step onto. And there's going to be some things that everybody's going to have to do to prepare that ground to get it ready for you to step on so that you can leave that other land. It's not somebody can just say, okay, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to live without money, okay? Just try that once right off the bat, you know. So you'll probably starve first and go back to the same system you, you left. But if you work at getting off continually, maybe in the next five years you can totally say I've jumped completely. But at least you got to start someplace and you got to work at a plan, at a goal. But that's where I say most people don't understand what the plan is or what the goal is. You know, what are we working for? You, know, you say, move to this kingdom. Well, what's the kingdom? What do I do? Uh, how do I do it? Okay, that's what we're getting into slowly, more and more. But it's the teaching of what the pearl is, what the kingdom is, what the treasure is, and how important it is getting that doctrine down so that they see that, hey, yeah, you're right, I got to do this. And then this is how we're going to do it. If anybody wants to join us, can come join us. Not that we don't uh, want to live in houses. We don't want to live in tents. No, I don't want to live in a tent. Nobody wants to live in a tent. I mean, we got houses today. Why not live in a house? Okay, but how are we going to get there? How are you going to How are you going to get there without a mortgage? But everybody asks you, you know, just CW, tell me, you know, how are we going to do that? No, I want you to think about it for a while. I want that hard ground of your mind to start softening up because I keep pouring the water on it. Getting everybody to think about it, you know, think about how you can operate without money. Most people, that's a, that's a, they start choking on that. They can't see how they do that. Only because they haven't really thought about it more and more and more. And they get stuck on it. Well, i got to do away with money. But they you miss the part, you know, okay, well, how are you going to do that? Well, hydroponics, rabbits, you know, start creating things. They just can't imagine, you know, how am I going to grow rabbits? Or how am I going to make hydroponics, you know? Uh, you know, how am I going to live without money? <laughs> i got a family. i got to take and put them in a house. Well, you know, you're going to have to build a house first to take your family put it in the house. How are you going to do that? I used to be a carpenter. I can help. Yeah, we've got I'm a lot back. of people with different skills, and then it doesn't take skills. It takes a desire to, say, want to do it. And maybe you might not want to do it, but let's put it this way. It comes down to a responsibility that you must do it. Because it's necessary. Well, I don't want to be a garbage collector. Yeah, but let me tell you something. If that job needed to be done, I'd go collect the garbage. Might not like it, but I know it's got to be done. Somebody's got to do it. I've and done that. Attitude. I've been a garbage collector. Yeah. When we get that kind of attitude, now stuff gets done.
by the way, just in case and for the record, there are a lot of um, how-to videos on YouTube for smelting, for aquaponics, hydroponics, um, just about anything. It's, there's somebody out there already done it, and they're working to perfect it, and it can it can be done to self-sustain. People should look into it. Yeah, I have an eight-foot A-frame in the backyard that I'm building that I don't have completed yet. That's going to have 13 U-tubes, one on one side connected to the other side, a U. Not U-tube, uh, you know, but they're connected in a U-shaped tube of that green Schedule 40 pipe with three-inch holes in them every six to eight inches that's connected to a system with a pump. And there could be a tank below it with fish in it. Now, I can probably grow tons of stuff in there. So when we get that finished and we get it working, then we'll have a ton of pictures and examples and show everybody and put it like on a CD and we can give the CD to the people and the churches and churches could start building this stuff in their backyards. And we could start encouraging people to do the same at home. Very true. I'm looking forward to, uh, even in my apartment, I was just going to ask you about a lighting question, if you don't mind, and if anybody else knows, they can, you know, jump when they come on and just give a little idea. I was wondering about the strength of a light on um, such a A-frame size uh, project because I have space in my living room. And I was just wondering, from the light from the top to the bottom, is it going to be equal? Well, I think the law, the distance, greater the distance from the bulb, the weaker the, the uh, light is. And uh, like fluorescent bulbs are going to be, you know, you got to have them up close. you got to have them right on it. Mm-hmm. Are there particular plants that would have worked uh, or rather grown with the lesser light at the bottom and the ones that needed it more would have been up at the top? Would that be prudent or still need more light? No, I think it pretty much the most plants need uh, about the same amount of lighting, but, you know, some leaves are bigger than other leaves. Mm -hmm. So it's planting the same kind of plant in the same place. If you're going to plant a smaller leaf plant, that's got to be on another one, you know. So you can't yeah. have a light on taller plants that grow taller because the lure ones and the same thing, you know, the bulb's not close enough to them, and they're going to grow spindly. Okay. So I suggest growing the same size plant in one particular bulb setup and get the bulb as close as you can to the plant, even when it's germinating. Okay, and all this information can pretty much be gathered from like YouTube and places like that, or D D DIY and. Yeah, um, there's a wealth of information out there already. Just gotta figure out which one's the better setup, or which would work better for you, and. Uh... Mhm. I had another question, if you didn't mind. Okay, I was thinking of how to accomplish acquiring a parcel of land, and though it has been mentioned to just go out and stake it, uh, I'm sure uh, I'm sure they're not going to totally accept that. Uh, so we would have to work with someone, a realtor or a private. And so we would really have to be looking for somebody would, uh, that would accept soft conditions. Because, I mean, it would take a moment to start up and get things into motion. And, you know, you got to do pH levels and setting up and things, construction. And so you're not going to have a monetary way of compensating them or through the uh, vegetables or through the smelting. Now, the smelting might make the income. But what else would you suggest? 
do like Jacob did to get his wives. Jacob wanted Leah. Jacob didn't have any money. He couldn't buy his wives. He didn't have any money. But yet he had two wives there. I mean, it was tricky to take the older sister as well, uh, but, you know, how did he get his wives? Put his work and his time into whatever was asked of him. Yeah, yeah, he he sold himself into to an indenture for seven years for each one. Um, I'm not psychologically prepared to even do anything like that. Yeah, well, I one, but that's proof that you can't do it without money. What would some of the other ways be? Okay, uh, if I bought a piece of ground from this guy, he wants money. All right, he wants money. That's all he's going to take. So it's going to take money. Hey, get the coin out of the fish's mouth. Now, that may be metaphorically, but what is it that I could do? Well, I would want to start creating something, start making something, which is mimicking God, which is being an imitator of God, Ephesians 5.1, because God's a creator. If we would just mimic God in creating things, now... We have the total conversion of our time into the thing. And if I sell that thing to the Gentiles, which I'm allowed to do, so that I can give to my brother freely, who is in the kingdom, then I can convert what I made from substance 100% and convert it into money. And now I got the money to buy the land. So what kind of product can you create with your talents, your skills that God has already given you or develop to produce some kind of substance that you can sell to the world that God will bless and that return will be your time conversion into the money that you could take and buy the land that this guy wants paid money for? Now, that's one way. You can do the NTT process to get the land. There's another. So there are several options of ways you can do it. You can do okay. it the worldly way, or you can do it the kingdom way. And you got several different options in there. Okay. I'm sure everyone would want to do it the kingly way uh, without – because for some reason, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I watch movies and I'm thinking of um, Christopher Walken and he comes in and he says, would you really like to see an angel? His wings are dripping in blood. So my point being is uh, even in heaven, somehow or another, there's some blood up in there. And I didn't want to come with too much on me by doing commerce to get to doing the righteous thing. Well, let's put it this way. If you're found doing less and less commerce, eventually you'll get it totally out. Okay. So uh, what I'm meaning is because we have learned the NTT way, frontwards and backwards. But we also know that that's also a bad rabbit hole to go to but it can resolve and extinguish so that we can go into the private to be able to have the kingdom and live the kingdom. So yeah, I'm not saying that we need to totally, you know, not use money, uh, but we need to use it right, righteously. With mm-hmm. kingdom. And, you know, eventually I see no need to use money at all, but that, is down in the future. Well, actually, it really would seem simple and quick because we as a people were a lot better when we were producing our spirit and our, our chutzpah. 
when we was constructionally the 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 economic growth country, we were great, and uh, even though it was through some bad times. But anyway, and so. Yeah, well, we got off on the wrong foot, and we really didn't need commerce at all. But you can't reverse, say, thousands of years of history overnight. Only Christ can do that. But until he comes back and does that, hey, we're going to have to work at it, you know, and do what we can, and it might happen slowly. But at least we're found doing the work. You know, Christ said at this time, so as not to offend him, go take the coin out of the fish's mouth and go pay the tax. Gunshots. Live in the godly way. Loving our, brother, loving our brothers that we love ourselves. As we're practicing these things day by day and moment by moment, isn't that a connecting with God? Yeah, when you invoke my name, that's when you obligate God to do for you because you're coming into equity doing equity. You're loving your brother like he says. And that opens the windows of heaven to bless you in return and fill your empty basket up. Okay, but, uh, I mean, we're not literally calling, Jesus, come down and save the, you know, my... Well, that ain't going to happen that way. It only happens when you do something. Yeah, right? yeah. You can speak all that you want. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm, I mean, I'm just... You get inundated by the way people are marketing, and I mean marketing, yeah, Jesus. the kingdom is going to manifest in your life until you manifest it. It's there. You've got to manifest it, though. You've got to work at it. There's something that you've got to do to make it happen. And you just can't speak it into action. You know, it's got to be an action. It's always requiring prayer and an action. Prayer without an action doesn't complete the circuit. Stepping out in faith and what you asked for, that does. And if you don't get right off the bat what you asked for, keep on seeking, keep on knocking, keep on asking. You know, your father will not give you a stone. He won't just give you a snake. Especially if it's for the good of others. If you're out there trying to lead the people and give and do good deeds, God will turn around and bless you because he has he knows what you have need of. And he's only looking for people that he can get stuff through. But we want to hoard it ourselves. We want to use it ourselves. No. And God's trying to get it through you to somebody else. It's like when we start tapping into the infinite source of the supply, no problem feeding as many as you want. Oh, anything else? No, I just wanted to touch base with you this evening. You have a good evening and bless everyone. Okay, all right. Uh, thanks for coming on, Lawrence. Oh, bless y'all. Okay, it's after 10 o'clock and i got to cut it short tonight, so... Uh, I think that's the last we're going to do, and we'll pick up next week on uh, well, the chapter we leave off on, uh, chapter 15. Pick up on chapter 15 next week, and uh, we'll see you all same time, same channel, and everybody be blessed. Night all. <laughs>